Welcome to The Criminologist, where the complex realities of criminal justice meet transformative solutions. Join host Joseph Arvidsson as he speaks with leading researchers, practitioners, and those who've lived the journey from crime to change. Together, we dive into the latest science and interventions supporting desistance and reintegration, challenging media-driven myths clouding our perceptions. Tune in to learn from true experts in the field and those who've walked the path themselves. And now, please welcome your host, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello, and welcome to episode 219 of the Criminologist Podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. A quick shout out to Omega 8, my virtual companion, helping out this week with our introduction, looking to do more things with artificial intelligence as we move forward on the program. So keep an ear out for more interactions with our friend Omega 8. Hey, welcome back to The Criminologist, where we unpack the complex layers of criminal justice, guided by expertise and transformative insights. I'm your host, Joseph Arvidsson, and today we dive into one of the most nuanced and often misunderstood facets of the criminal justice field, that of false confessions. For this episode, I am joined by friend of the podcast, Dr. Jared Brown, a true multidisciplinary expert in, among other things, neurocriminology, who brings an illuminating perspective to this topic of false confessions. False confessions are a significant yet rarely fully understood factor in wrongful convictions. Dr. Brown sheds light on how they come about, from coerced compliance to internalized confessions, and offers insight into the vulnerabilities of those at risk, including cognitive impairments, neurodevelopmental disorders, and high suggestibility. This conversation reminds us that anyone under certain conditions can find themselves in a situation where a false confession becomes a tragic reality. But it does not stop there. We explore how nutritional deficiencies, mental health, and even basic needs like sleep can influence an individual's behavior and decision making. Dr. Brown's work connects these physical and psychological factors to the accuracy and reliability of client interviews, urging us to consider a more comprehensive view in our work, a view that stretches beyond the traditional risk-needs-responsivity framework. This conversation has layers, from the role of neurocriminology in understanding clients' vulnerabilities, to the importance of creating sensory-friendly environments in courts and probation settings. Dr. Brown and I share a commitment to lifelong learning, especially as we work toward a justice system that is both fair and informed. So, Sit back as we untangle the science behind false confessions and explore how we can explore these insights in every interaction, from the interview room to the courtroom. Now please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Jared Brown, and I will see you all on the other side. Well, welcome back to the Criminologist Podcast, Jared. So nice to have you on the show. We always learn so much from you when you grace us with your presence, not just from the theoretical standpoint of the content that you're talking about, but I always appreciate, Jared, that you always circle back to those practical applications, whether they're interventions or tools or something that will allow the listener again, to sort of apply 
the uh, the truth bombs that you're going to start dropping on us today. This time in regards to false confessions. And I believe the approach we're going to take today, Jared, is at least to start out looking at that topic at sort of a view at 30,000 feet with false confessions. And then we can drill down into more more relevant things for the for the practitioner or more uh, specific area. So why don't we kick it off, Jared? I know you've been on the show multiple times. You're a friend of the show. But for the listener who may have not caught any of your previous installments, go ahead and introduce yourself to the listener. And then, yeah, let's let's kick off this chat around false confessions. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Joe, for having me back, my friend, and hope all of you are doing well. And my name's Jared. I wear a couple different hats. I'm a professor. I do a lot of training for different groups. I do quite a bit of consulting for a number of groups on a variety of topics. And I do quite a bit of writing and, and publishing, and I go on a lot of different podcast programs talking about a variety of, of topics and Where I spend a great deal of my time now is related to the field of neurocriminology. I'm also working on another degree right now in applied clinical nutrition. So I'm trying to weave in the the world of nutrition into the criminal justice, the legal forensic arena. And sometimes people are confused. Why, Why would you do that? How does nutrition relate to all these things? Well, Food insecurity is a risk factor for all kinds of not so good things. Nutritional deficiencies in the brain can make your clients do very poor things and play significant roles with mental health and substance misuse. So we've talked about some of these things on other podcasts, but that's kind of where I'm spending most of my time now. And sometimes people ask you, why false confessions and, and things like that? I, I've done trainings on related topics. I'm, I've consulted on different cases where there's been like Miranda rights, comprehension issues, confabulation, suggestibility, and just very interested in the field of false confessions, particularly as it relates to autism, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, ADHD, traumatic brain injuries, and intellectual and developmental disabilities. I love the approach you take, Jared, that that holistic approach to interacting with other humans. Actually, I I take that approach and the work that that I do with justice impacted individuals and realize that, as you just noted, we we've gotten so good at specializing in certain areas that sometimes we just don't see the forest from the big picture tree up to and including what you just talked about, the role of nutrition the role of not getting enough sleep, for example. I think it's time in the field. We've we've looked at the big picture stuff primarily through the risk needs responsivity framework, but certainly as I've discovered in the creation of the tides model that Nicole Kimberly Staley and I developed, but even the work you're doing, realizing that from that individual's perspective, they have an array of variables in their lives that all contribute to behaviors and we need to consider consider all of them, which is what you're all about as well. You're trying because, I mean, I'm digging into the weeds, but every time I dig in those weeds, I come up with other things. I have no idea what that means. I got to go research, uh, continuing to learn. So lifelong learning, stay curious. Don't ever get to a point where you think you know everything. And I think you'll be a-okay. So let me ask the first question, Jared, which is likely the question on the minds of many listeners. But generally speaking, what are some of the most common reasons why individuals might falsely confess to a crime? And then I really want to ask you the follow up, particularly if those individuals have some type of neurodevelopmental disorder. But I'll let you answer the first part of the question first. Yeah, if we back it up even a little bit more, false confessions are a major contributor to wrongful convictions. So if someone falsely confesses, it doesn't always mean they're going to be wrongly convicted, but it sure makes it more likely. So false confessions, a major contributor to wrongful convictions, 
We never want to see that happen. Other things you want to consider in the wrongful conviction literature is just the flawed or faulty eyewitness testimony. That's a factor. Looking at forensic science evidence, maybe there's some faulty practices at play. Unfortunately, most law enforcement officers do a wonderful job, but of course, like every industry, there are some professionals that engage in misconduct or problematic practices. That's a factor in some cases of wrongful conviction. Thinking of bias or tunnel vision, I'm sure we all have that happen in some aspects of life, but if we come in with preconceived notions, we start having tunnel vision we start finding everything possible that lines up with our belief, that can be really problematic. Ineffective assistance of counsel, that's a factor too. Maybe someone was represented by an attorney and maybe that attorney did not have adequate training in a particular area related to that defendant's whatever needs or disorder. So those are a few things that can contribute to wrongful convictions. And if you look at the false confession literature, Joe, there's different subtypes. It's kind of the big three that are consistently talked about. There's voluntary false confessions where somebody just voluntarily confesses to a crime. There's something called coerced, compliant types of false confessions where they, they have a tendency to agree with law enforcement, there's investigative or interrogative pressure, they're not able to cope with the situation at hand when they're being interviewed by law enforcement, and then there's coerced, internalized kinds of false confessions where the law enforcement interviewer, whatever tactic they're using, over time during that interview, that innocent suspect comes to truly believe that they committed a crime. So th those are kind of the big three you're gonna, gonna find in the research literature. But when we think about like, what are all the factors at play here that could contribute to a false confession? I think we're all prone to falsely confessing under the wrong set of circumstances. You and I could probably false confess to something if we were being interrogated for 36 hours straight and we're sleep deprived and our blood sugar levels are all over the map. And But just think about if it's a client that has significant vulnerabilities, brain-based vulnerabilities, body-based impairments. So when we think about just in general, even if it's not false confessions, but if you're an interviewer of any kind, you're doing an intake, an assessment, a PSI, whatever it is, the client you're interviewing, what factors get in the way of that person providing accurate and reliable information? Cognitive factors, we talk about that all the time, executive dysfunction, metacognitive impairments, maybe there's low intellectual functioning capabilities. Maybe your client has a very poor memory and they don't remember, but they don't tell you they don't remember, and they just go along with what you say, and they start filling in gaps in their memory. We could have memory distrust syndrome going on. We could have confabulation. What happens if your client has certain personality traits where they are highly naive, highly vulnerable, they acquiesce, and what's their mental state like during the interview as well? Did they just witness something really horrific and they're in shock? Are they coming down from a drug or alcohol high and they're having withdrawal symptoms? Are, are they just having a profound feelings of guilt and shock and anxiety and depression? Think about those things when you're interviewing clients. That's it, not an all-encompassing list, but those are a few things. What makes uh, an interviewee, a suspect, a defendant, even a witness vulnerable? Immaturity, developmental immaturity. So what is that? You're interviewing a client, they're 20 years old on paper, they have developmental immaturity. They may actually function as a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, even though they have a body and a chronological age of someone much older. High levels of suggestibility places people at great risk of vulnerabilities during the interview. 
the memory is one that you have to be aware of. Language is a big factor too, talked about in this literature. Most people in prison, according to the research, have some form of language or communication problems. In an ideal world, every jail, every prison, every probation department would have training on speech, language, and communication and routinely screened for language problems. The same would be for dyslexia. As many as 60% of people in prison have dyslexia. How often do probation corrections officers think about those things? Almost never, I would assume, just based on the trainings. Maybe there's some. Limited attention span. If you're interviewing uh, somebody and they're distracted constantly and they can't pay attention to you and they can't stay focused, they're probably not catching every word you're saying, so they're not grasping every question, but they may carelessly respond to a question they don't understand. Information processing deficits is another big variable you'd want to take into account. If you're interviewing a client that has information processing deficits, all the words coming at that person get stockpiled up in their brain and it becomes a traffic jam. And they can't make sense of all these words. Their brain shuts down. In some cases, you might have a trauma reaction. They could become more aggressive. I mentioned the topic of confabulation. Big, big variable to consider in false confession cases. If you're not familiar with that term, it's a type of false memory creation. There's spontaneous types of confabulation that can happen. That's probably going to be more common among some people with like really serious mental health issues or neurodegenerative disorders. There's provoked confabulation that happens as a result of being interviewed or questioned. Think of it as gap filling. The research literature, one author called it honest lying. The person may be making up a story, but in their mind, they're telling it as a truth, even though maybe after you dig into it, you find out that's not accurate or it could be taken out of temporal context, which basically means the client's reporting something to you during the interview that happened to them this morning. After you do a little checking, you find out nah, that didn't happen to them this morning. They're talking about something that happened a month ago or 10 years ago. Those are a few variables. I have many more, Joe. I'll Park the brakes. Let's let's see what you think, my friend. So I want to dovetail back, Jared, if you don't mind, because I'm still processing what you kicked this off with by merely educating the listener and me on the on the different types of false confessions. When you mentioned voluntary, coerced compliance and coerced internalized and I suspect there's other listeners out there who maybe heard the topic here. And when we think of false confessions, I think a lot of us think of, you know, the, the stereotypical, I kidnapped the Lindbergh baby, or I'm dating myself there, but <laughs> I think, you know, where I'm going, you know, <laughs> yes. it's these high profile, they're all in. And as you, as you laid out there, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced between that and it's again sort of on a continuum here so thank you for that um of course and then also and you mentioned assessment i know that many of our listeners are not in that law enforcement lane as much as they're in that corrections probation parole lane and if they're like me i am already connecting the dots here to the work we do with risk assessment whereas it's it, it, it's it's not the equivalent of falsely confessing to a crime, but there that risk assessment could be made up of many little areas of false confessions along along the way. You mentioned some of my favorite topics around suggestibility and confabulation. I should note that you and I did co-author a paper on FASD and the risk needs responsivity model where we talked about some of these things and I can leave a link for that paper. Uh, for the listeners as well. But Jared, maybe talk about, again, how a probation parole officer, somebody who 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 wheels and deals in in risk assessment, 
the administration of, and then also, you know, making case plans based on those, but maybe just some best practices for those practitioners and professionals just to be aware of. So they're not, as you're saying, taking everything the client is saying verbatim and not considering this other array of variables at play. Yeah, there's so many other traits and factors that may increase risk of false confession. And obviously the focus today is false confession, but you can take these concepts and the more you learn about it, you're going to be better off in your interview, your intake, your treatment plan, whatever you do. But low self-esteem is a potential variable to consider in false confession research literature. People are surprised to hear that, but it makes sense because if you have low self-esteem, you have lower levels of assertiveness. You probably don't want to ruffle the feathers. You're probably more likely to go along and be compliant. High, high levels of untreated mental health issues has been talked about in the false confession literature. So distorted perceptions, you might, people psychosis, breakdowns in reality monitoring where they get things mixed up and did it actually happen to them or are they dreaming it? Judgment issues. If you're working with clients with profound judgment issues and reasoning deficits, that's a risk factor. And if you're ever working with a client who has decision-making, problem-solving, reasoning, or judgment issues, what should that alert you to? Executive function problems, metacognitive impairments, thinking about thinking, knowing about knowing. And Joe, you, you know the low self-control literature well with the R&R model, but people who have very low levels of self-control, that is also a risk factor for false confessions. Why is that the case? Because you're impulsive, you're erratic, you don't think through things, you don't connect the dots, you're not seeing how your statements right now may actually get you convicted of a crime down the road. You just carelessly throw things out and you're not thinking through things. Low self-control, definitely a variable to take into account. Anytime that you guys can all learn about comprehension deficits, that's very, very important. If your client struggles with comprehension, and there's many aspects of comprehension, auditory comprehension, how do we make sense of it when we hear it? Reading comprehension. If you're a court admitted or whatever you do, you're a court person and the defendant leaves court and you give them a bunch of papers and they, hey, go read this. And they have a reading comprehension deficit. They're not going to read it. If they even act like they read it, they're not going to understand it. So comprehension deficits, big, big variable to take into account. I think it's also important to consider, and this is kind of outside the scope today, but you mentioned this a little bit. Miranda rights issues is a big thing when we talk about false confessions too. And you asked about like neurodevelopmental disorders. What are some factors to be aware of in the neurodevelopmental disorder literature? And this can apply to any diagnosis. Cognitive impairments, Abstract reasoning deficits, that's basically people that are going to have a hard time connecting the dots, understanding how and why questions, seeing the forest through the trees, lower levels of intellectual functioning is a factor to take into account, social cognition deficits, theory of mind deficits, mentalization problems, if they have a high level of social vulnerability and they don't understand like threat detection. They don't pick up on the fact that someone's trying to take advantage of them. Poor coping skills. If you're being interviewed by a law enforcement officer, that's stressful for anybody. And if you have really poor coping skills, you might say anything you think that law enforcement officer wants to hear just to get the interview over with because you're dealing with such a high level of anxiety. You didn't realize now you just admitted to a crime. Maybe you didn't commit or maybe you did who knows but those are a few factors in the neurodevelopmental disorder literature to take into account do you want me to go a little bit deeper into confabulation joe or some other best practices i just want to make sure we're covering everything here well as you typically do jared when you speak it gets my mind thinking of a, a litany of other 
related topics and you've done it again. But when you're talking about Paul's confessions and Miranda writes, looking at this through my lens of a former probation officer, I'm I'm thinking of all of the implications, Jared, to when in the course of their normal duties, probation officers file probation violations with the court and they bring the client back into court, oftentimes in custody and basically read a laundry list sometimes of allegations, at which point the judge turns to the client and ask, do you wish to admit or deny, admit or deny, admit or deny? And for example, when you were talking about, I don't know if it was the the coerced internalized or the coerced compliant, but when you talked about the individual maybe acknowledging something but not realizing it, it happened a year ago and not a month ago or a, a, a month ago and not a week ago, I was just thinking how much of this could be viewed through that probation violation lens, which is basically getting folks to confess to behavioral allegations, but how much of this should be infused into that training and education when it comes to this this type of thing? It could all be infused because everything I'm talking about has implications for all sectors of the criminal justice, forensic mental health arena. And it's tricky. I know the court system and I know lots of probation officers and then interviewers are trained on asking lots and yes or no questions. And that's not good for a lot of these clients because what happens when you ask a bunch of yes or no questions, you get a yes or no response and then you move on. How do you know if that client truly understands what they just said yes to or what they just said no to what happens if your client gives you a, a, a head nod, like up and down, you are probably going to jump to the conclusion, I'm assuming, that, yeah, this client gets it. But what happens if you have a client who has gone through life knowing how to navigate the system a little bit, and they know how to get by with maybe not admitting that they have some deficits, and they just give the verbal head nod, and they get brushed aside and move on to the next level. And that happens all the time, especially with the clients that are lower functioning neurodevelopmental disorders. Fact check, verify if you ask yes or no questions. Have them repeat back in their own words. I know court moves quickly, but if you got clients with these brain based impairments, there's a lot that their brain can't take in in a short amount of time. They need extra time to process. What happens if that defendant? has sensory processing issues and bright lights and background noise and multiple conversations going on at once overwhelms their brain. It's very important for courts to understand this. It's very important for attorneys to understand this. And it's very important when you have especially complex clients, hire a consultant, hire an expert who can come in and educate the court about all these nuanced things. What's going on here? Why is that defendant laughing at inappropriate times? Why are they shutting down and falling asleep? Why during cross-examination are they just having extreme emotional outbursts? On the surface, it could look like that person's guilty. They're not taking it serious. But if you peel back the layers, could they be dealing with untreated trauma? Could they have a brain injury? Could they be dealing with sluggish cognitive tempo that makes them look like deers in the headlights and they just are apathetic and they sit there and they're spacey? I and mean, there's a million topics here and there's so much to talk about. But the more we can learn about these things, regardless of what setting you're in, I think you'll be in a better position. At least take a pause for a minute. Why is this client having this reaction? Let's not jump to the conclusion. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Are there some records we can review? Maybe that client would do well being referred to an evaluator for some more testing. When's the last time they've gone to their medical doctor? I don't want to open up this can of worms, but what happens if the client has untreated diabetes or an iron deficiency or low blood sugar levels or vitamin D levels that are low? I mean, that's why I'm doing the nutrition program because all of those things factor into behavioral presentations as well. So 
hopefully people walk away here. Heads are spinning a little bit, but give them some things to chew on and dig deeper. We've covered a lot of these topics in detail in other podcasts we've done, but definitely more than happy, Joe, to go deeper into any one of those topics right now or in the future. Jerry, maybe talk about you. You teased with a little bit of interventions that are out there or I guess I could say more broadly best practices, but if there's, if there's one or two things that a listener out there could tuck in their back pocket and just bring to the job on Monday morning, when they get back to supervising that caseload, let's say what might, what might some good tips and tricks be for the practitioner? And you'll never go wrong becoming trauma informed. You'll never go wrong becoming executive function informed. I mean, most of your clients in the criminal justice system have trauma histories. Most have executive function impairments. Half your clients probably have a TBI in their history. 60% maybe have undiagnosed dyslexia. I mean, most are going to have sleep issues. The research shows, I mean, th those are just some basic things to think about. But I would also say if, if you are an actual law enforcement interviewer, and you're really focused on false confession research, or if you're an attorney listening to this or legal professional, best practices, record the interview. So an expert can go back and review it and like where best practices followed. I think that is very, very important to be aware of. Making sure you are getting the most up-to-date training on best practices in investigative interviewing forensic interviewing if you're a forensic social worker you're you're working in one of those settings we've published together joe i've done a lot of publishing on fasd but when if you take like some of my knowledge and research on fasd and apply it to any kind of interview situation use simple and concrete language because some of the clients may have vocabulary deficits and if they have vocabulary deficits and you're using words like an oath or a plea agreement, I mean, to a lot of clients, what, what, what does that truly mean? Make sure you're using simple, concrete language. Best practices talk about minimize suggestibility, avoid leading questions, avoid double barreled questions, forced choice questions, and even repeated questions. The question comes up, why, why would you want to avoid repeated questions? That gets tricky. Obviously, if the client didn't hear it, it didn't make sense. That's a different ballgame. But why would you want to avoid repeated questions over and over again? Because the research literature shows for some vulnerable brains, if they're hearing that same question being asked to them by that interviewer, their first response ends up changing and they shift the response to go along with the interviewer or that repeated kinds of lines of questioning can contribute to confabulation, false memory creation, allow plenty of time for your client to respond. Even if there's silence, some clients with information processing deficits may sit there in silence, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds. Be okay with that. Don't rush the person. Look around your office. If you're interviewing someone in your office, Become sensory friendly. Do some Googling searching. Maybe talk to a sensory specialist. Take a 360 look at your office. If your office is full of clutter, pictures on the wall everywhere, which are probably beautiful, but maybe there's bright colors. There's so much going on in there. If there's incense going, candles, lotions, perfume, cologne, if you're interviewing somebody that has a vulnerable brain and sensory processing issues, any one of those factors could adversely impact their brain and shut them down. And that interview is not going to go as well. And the last thing I'll say, and there's many more, but we don't, I know we don't have time. Be mindful of fatigue. For some of the people you interview, they may not be able to sit through a 45 minute to an hour long interview. Their brains maybe only be able to take something in every five minutes. Take more frequent breaks. 
if appropriate, I know not every setting can do this, but if you can go for a walk with a client and talk. I know that's not possible, obviously, if you're doing an interrogation and investigative interview, but walking can help the brain slow down. The client make sure they're hydrated, have plenty of water, make sure there's breaks for bathrooms, things like that. Very common sense things, but these are all things found in this literature as well. As you speak, Jared, I am reminding myself that as as a risk assessment trainer, specifically, I train on the level of service case management inventory or the LSCMI, which is one of the big tools out there in our in our world. But yeah, I, I I I need to go back and dust off the training module that I do around interviewing practices and sprinkle in a lot of what you're just what you just mentioned here. Um, you noted the paper that you and I authored on FASD and the RNR system, but I recall a big chunk of that paper covered covered this this topic, and I think it could more broadly be applied to a lot of interviews that we do uh, in the world of, of corrections. So thank you for that, that reminder that all these paths tend to collapse in on each other, which again, back to the holistic approach is what I really, really appreciate about, or appreciate about you, Dr. Brown. Please call me Jared, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to mix it up a little bit, Jared. It's always a pleasure to have you on the criminologist podcast. I want to allow you to plug because you've mentioned neuroscience a few times. Plug your amazing program that you have that I have graduated from on becoming a neurocriminology informed professional. Yeah, I developed uh, that program for the American Institute for the Advancement of Forensic Studies. That's an organization I founded in 2011. We offer continuing education trainings to a variety of professionals online now. And that's a a training program, I think, at this point. Joe, you probably remember better than I do. I think there's maybe like 14 different trainings in there in the program. Each one's three hours in length. Yep. There's one on uh, prenatal factors involved in criminality. There's one on nutritional factors. There's trauma. There's brain-based impairments. And... If you want to learn about the field of neurocriminology, basically the infusion of neuroscience into criminal justice related topics, and you want to dig into the neurobiological underpinnings of criminal behavior or dysregulated human behavior, dysfunctional human behavior, it really talks about it from a holistic lens from brain and body and prenatal and family and social and nutritional and genetics and physiological factors to name a few. And I can attest, Jared, as a graduate of said program, that if there's a listener out there who is thinking or wondering, boy, there's that one missing piece of the puzzle here. I'm so close to understanding why my clients behave the way they behave. Or we've been throwing around that word holistic all day, Jared. But yeah, if you want to just see the big picture here and 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 really connect a lot of the dots that you haven't been able to connect, I would highly recommend that program on becoming a neurocriminology informed professional. It is the future folks. It is the next frontier. I can assure you. And I'll leave a link to that program in the description of this podcast episode. So listeners can just go there and click and get all the information they need. I'll also leave your direct contact information as well, Jared. So folks can reach out to you about that program or any of the other amazing offerings that you have provided to me and so many others. Jared, thanks again. We need to get you back on. I know we're probably behind on our series on infamous serial killers. I'm trying to tax my own memory and recall who we thought we were going to line up and have on deck next. My memory serves me correctly, which we know from the memory research. We don't want to believe our memory all the time. (laughs) Eileen Wuornos comes to mind, I think. Yep, it was Eileen Wuornos. We've never profiled a female yet, so I thought that would would take a detour from all the males. I think that would be a quite interesting case. I know there's a lot of trauma in her history, so we definitely look through a trauma lens, amongst other things. Yeah, that would be a great great profile um, to highlight, so... Stay tuned for that, listeners. Jared Brown, 
from Concordia University, also from APHIS. Thank you so much, my friend. Until next time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. And that brings us to the close of another essential conversation here on the Criminologist Podcast. I want to extend a special thanks to Dr. Jared Brown for taking the time to share his deep insights with us. Today's episode touched on a range of topics that go right to the heart of our work as probation officers, prison staff, and others in the field of justice. From false confessions and wrongful convictions to the impact of neurodevelopmental factors, nutrition, and mental health, Dr. Brown's perspectives help us appreciate the layers of complexity involved in our daily interactions with clients. In a field where every decision counts, understanding vulnerabilities like cognitive impairments, neurodevelopmental disorders, or the effects of untreated physical health issues can make all the difference. Dr. Brown's insights today challenge us to look beyond behavior to the underlying factors that might be influencing our clients' actions. We're reminded of the importance of a comprehensive approach that goes beyond the risk-needs responsivity model to encompass the whole person. And that's the perspective that leads to more effective, compassionate interventions. As promised, I will be leaving links in the show notes for those who want to explore further. You will find a link to Dr. Brown's Neurocriminology Informed Professional Certificate Program, a powerful resource for deepening your understanding of the brain behavior connection. I'll also include our co-authored paper on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the risk-need responsivity framework, a valuable read for anyone working in assessments or client interviews. And if you'd like to connect with Dr. Brown directly, his contact information is included as well. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more conversations aimed at equipping you with the knowledge and insights that make a difference in your practice. Until next time, stay curious, keep challenging the narrative, and remember that the work you do matters every single day. This is Joseph Arvidson signing off from the Criminologist Podcast. And always remember, folks, there's no them, there's only us. And what's their mental state like during the interview as well? Did they just witness something really horrific and they're in shock? Are they coming down from a drug or alcohol high and they're having withdrawal symptoms? Are are they just having profound feelings of guilt and shock and anxiety and depression? Think about those things when you're interviewing clients. That's not an all-encompassing list, but those are a, a few things. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review. And thanks for listening.